Respecto, respecto, which is, of course, Galician for Achtung, Achtung. How have they ended up with respect? Anyway, let's keep moving. That's almost <laughs> a full house of Spanish languages, I think. James, now, um, you interviewed John McManus recently in Normandy, um, having just seen the Bayer Tapestry, which yes. prompted an interesting question. In fact, read that podcast was, was very, very interesting because we had a little sprinkle of James Gavin, didn't we? Yeah, a little, yeah, bit, of James, a little, little bit, bit of Jimmy Gavin. A little, little bit of Jimmy Gavin there. Yeah, and we've also discovered, haven't we, that um, not only did he uh, have his way with Martha Gellhorn, which I did know about, I did not know about Marlena Daitry. I know, yeah. Jimmy, jumping Jimmy, as it Jumping were. Jim. <laughs> but, um, I mean, there was a very funny moment where John went, with respect to RG. About, about, about <laughs> RG great. Pullison's... Uh, yeah, I still, I still, even though he's a Jim Ga- Gavin super fan, John McManus... Even though he was pretty... I st- it's, His joint favourite general of all time. That's exactly what he said. I, st- I still don't know why he didn't take the bridge on D-Day of Marky Garden. Still doesn't make, still don't make no sense well, to I'm, me. Well, I'm, of course, I'm revisiting Jim Gavin with um, with Sisley. I'm doing all his work on Sisley yeah, at the moment. Yeah. And so he's very much to the fore in that. Superstar general, though. Anyway. Yes. Um, so you saw the the Bayer Tapestry. And um, uh, I re- if anyone, if you if you ever find yourself in Bayer, which is a funny little town, I recommend it. It's um, Oh, it's amazing. It's I was completely, blown it's away. It's completely amazing, isn't it? it? Is I remember going brilliant. to see it when I was when I was like I must have been six with or yeah. eight or something with my grandparents, and then going again about ten years ago, and it the the facility it being like this odd spooky memory because they haven't end updated the place at all. It's exactly the same, but the t- tapestry is incredible. Yeah, isn't it? they have now, and the, the the place you see it's all kind of you know super lit and exactly really oh, in that's a way good. that's not going to kind of sort of harm the fibers and all this kind of stuff. It's brilliant. Oh, that's good, excellent. But what was really good was the commentator. Yeah, <laughs> yes, know? yes, it's all, it's all. And then King Harold. You know, yeah, with, with with sort of um, uh, lips and lips pipes and stuff. It's yeah. absolutely brilliant. <laughs> right, <laughs> but that threw up a question from one of our listeners, Man of Steel, who says, um, "Hi guys, loving the podcast. Oh, I love it. A uh, quick question: Considering that the Nazis like to grab stuff and send it home, it's one way of putting it. What happened to the Bayer tapestry during the war? Did they just leave it alone, or was it hidden?" Um, well, it was hidden to start off with. They put it in the basement of some hotel in Bayer, but it was right. then found by the Germans, and of course they did half-inch it, because that's what Germans always do. And in the did. war, in the war, did. in the yeah. war, oh, God, in the war, okay, <sighs> Nazi Germans, yeah, yeah. Nazis did. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say anything anymore, can you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Back in the war, the Nazis did steal it, and I think they t- they sent it to someone like Alsace or something to start off with. But anyway, it ends up in the Louvre from right. the middle of the war. It's in the Louvre, and um, von Choltitz, who yes, the, the Nazi who famously saves Paris from Hitler's blow it all up order. One of the reasons he says he does is because he doesn't want to destroy the bio tapestry as he's captured by the British. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, so it then stays in in the Louvre for a bit. Um, before being returned to by uh, quite a bit of time after the war, I think. Yeah, and I think, I think it, it stays in Louvre for a while. It's come here once, hasn't it? Has it come? It's to coming. UK? It's coming. It's coming. Twenty twenty-three. Right. Wow. President it's... Macron is is lending it to us. Very sweet of him. Okay. Well, it, I mean, he'll have to get it through customs, won't he? That's the only thing. Yeah. Big old tariff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Come on, just send that here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Might not, never get it back again. All right, okay, so another fascinating bit of correspondence from The Smith on Twitter, who points us in the direction of the Battle of Bamba Bridge. Now, um, if you don't know about this, I, and I didn't, and uh, was, was stumbled onto it by an excellent correspondent of ours on Twitter, The Smith, um, the Battle of Bamba, Bamba Bridge is uh, it's a small village outside Preston Bamba Bridge, and... This what there was a race riot in 1943 in, um, in the summer of 1943 in Detroit in June of 1943, and so what you get then in Lancashire on the June the 24th um, is a sort of race race convulsion within the U.S. military. Mm. Um, on, on the back of what's happened in on Detroit. On the back of what's happened in Detroit, Detroit, and the also reports. on the and on the back of basically how the American army's been handling its black soldiers yeah. and how. What it, it doesn't trust them with combat jobs. So they tend to be driving lorries, they tend to be doing supply, they tend to be doing stuff like that because the American army essentially has a has a race problem, yeah. a race issue. And and also because it's like a... Because it's racially segregated, 100... 
15 11th I don't know how you'd say that it's got to be 15 11th 15 11th right? quartermaster truck regiment so they're basically supplies people and those kind of places that officers who weren't much good would get put in them and all that sort of thing so you've got you've basically they're not being they're not being treated respectfully because they're not allowed to be combat soldiers they're not being treated the same as everyone else not being trusted the same as other black soldiers and they're being they're not being led well yeah and you end up with this situation where a number of black American soldiers are having a drink in Ye Old Hob Inn in Bamber Bridge and some white American military policemen turn up and try to um, arrest some of the black men. And there's obviously argument and controversy about, about who started it. Yeah. But what had happened is the village had been told that it um, should bar black men from certain um, uh, pubs. Yep. Yeah. And the locals refused to go along with the race bar that the American army was insisting on. Yeah. Um, and in fact, put signs up saying only black American servicemen allowed in these pubs. So feeding it, I mean, helpfully feeding into the tension. But it escalates and they end up with a, they end up with a riot. Well, in fact, the black Fisticuffs. soldiers, well, no, no, going to the armory, taking rifles for themselves and taking pot shots at MPs and an actual... Um, wow standoff with weapons one soldier killed and interestingly that you you get you get the mutinies of the people people are people are punished for mutiny and the related crimes and all that sort of thing but but actually the hammer comes down on the officers who've let this happen the racist attitudes in the american army the american army goes ah there's clearly a problem a real problem here and we need to do something about it Mm. which is i think really really interesting i mean well john mcmanus was really interesting about this yeah um, yeah. When I talked to him in Bayer, he was uh, he was fascinating. I mean, just it was a whole host of stuff that I hadn't thought about. But how it, you know, he was he was saying that what happened in the nineteen sixties was absolutely sort of presaged by what happened in in the Second World War. Yeah, of course, there was the ninety second Buffalo Division in in Italy, North, Northern Italy. And, and what's really interesting about that is when that's formed, you know, the first commanding general is a Southern white um, landowner. Yeah, who is the commanding general? I mean, you know, who thinks that's a good idea? Uh, and, and all the officers well, maybe, to start off with are all white. And well, maybe, all someone, maybe someone who thinks that a southern gent knows how to get black people to do what you want them to do. Yeah, but you, you, you have you to remember. I mean, but, I mean, 1934, cr- 1934, there was a public lynching which was attended by 20,000 people in Florida. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not that long ago. No. Um, it's amazing, really. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, so they don't perform terribly well, but they get, you know, like all these things, they, 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 they get better. And what they realise is actually it's not a question about having black divisions. It's about having good... People well, it's, it's, well. It's, about, it's about having you, you put you integrate people, you yeah. know, and you, you lead don't them, have black you divisions. Them, you, you have black and white and, divisions, and you lead them well, and you motivate them, and all, all those sort of things. And, and and it's the same with the Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah. They don't they don't have a white fighter. Group. They don't have a fighter group of which some black yeah. um, airmen are sent. They have a black fighter group. But then you get into yeah. But then you get into this thing where where then of course black soldiers run into the Germans and. The SS in particular, and you've, you, you've, you know, there's an incident in the Battle of the Bulge where um, African American artillerymen from an African, art, I mean, the, the unit's actually called one of the units is actually called 969th Field brackets African American Artillery B- Battalion. I mean, they're, not only are they racially seg- segregated, they're advertising it. Yeah. Um, uh, but some la- some guys from the 333rd who are like really who are a really successful regiment and who fire. 1,500 rounds in a 24-hour period. It's, this is all in, by the way, this is all Peter Caddick Adams, Adams' book about the Battle of Bulge, which I'm, I'm reading like mad, all the million words of it. Um, but, but they run into the SS, and there's 11 black GIs, artillerymen, who were murdered by the SS, you know, taken off and bayoneted or something, something you know. Yeah. So, that, so not only are you, uh, is the army, is the American army got this race problem that it really can't kind of... Um, quite deal with at the time trying to process at the time it's fighting a complete and implacably racist enemy i mean you know being being a you get the feeling that being a black gi in the the american army is you're between you argue between a rock and a hard place yeah and actually i mean the the, i mean the the germans are not good with with with, um, no with ethnic minorities no which brings us interestingly so we well uh, they're not ethnic minorities different ethnicities other races yeah 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 yeah. well yeah uh, yeah so we have a letter from Stephen Parks um, uh, uh, what's an email Um, this can't be a tweet it's too long Um, dear James and Al I finally got around to checking out your um, we have ways of making a podcast and I'm now binging it compulsive listening guys keep up the excellent work I I have to say um, several people have told me that they've been binging it and the idea of spending like Essentially, an entire day listening to you and me talk about this. 
I mean, that makes my blood run cold. But if, but you know, whatever floats, great. Your, whatever floats your boat, Stephen. Thank you um, very much. <laughs> as you encourage your listeners to ask questions, I'm wondering if this one's been covered yet. Or um, I guess if it has, I will come across the answer in one of the dozen or so podcasts I'm yet to catch up with. But if not, here goes. No, and we haven't touched on this. Given that the Nazi ideology was founded on racism, or racialism actually, as it called itself at the time, uh, how were captured Allied personnel from black and ethnic minorities treated by all branches of the Wehrmacht? This with particular um, regard to American GIs, especially those of Jewish and African-American heritage, while also focusing on ethnic minorities in the British Empire and Commonwealth forces. This question acknowledges the abominable treatment of POWs as Soviet forces, although such treatment is very much on the record, hence the focus of the question on the Western Allies. I'm assuming that regular Wehrmacht forces may have treated BAME personnel differently than those captured by SS units. And then he go now, so, so, and we've kind of, we've kind of touching on that, or we've touched on that already. Yep. Incidentally, and this is very interesting, I should add that my mother was German by birth and grew up in the Breslau area, which is now in Poland, Western Poland, Wroclaw. Her family fled to the West in January 1945 and ended up in the small town of Bad Piermont near Hamlin. She always mentioned, being age seven by then, how the school children were warned by Nazi propaganda, increasingly desperate in the face of the advancing Allied forces, that black GIs ate children. Crikey. I I would like to emphasise that she spent her adult life as a committed anti-racist. I look forward to hearing your answer sometime soon, if this indeed hasn't been covered already. Best wishes, Stephen Parks. Well, we haven't covered it, Stephen. I mean, we're we're touching on it now, prompted by talking to John last week and then... and an actual, and then this question from the Smith about this this mutiny, this incident. I mean, it's it's really really interesting because the- it is really interesting. And actually, the, the whole thing about the eating babies thing is 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 fascinating because I was in Sicily last week and I was talking to um, a veteran, um, a, a civilian who had witnessed the Americans landing at Jella, and obviously after after the um, after the counterattack on the on the second day by by the Germans and the Italians. The area of security, it, it continued throughout the campaign to be a major kind of beach from which supplies were processed. Yeah. And so in came the black troops and they were um, doing a lot of the supplies. And the lady I was talking to said that she remembers seeing a black man for the first time, an American GI, you know, who was service troops, um, coming up the road with some supplies. And her mother pulled her in from the, um, from the window and said, don't, don't look at him because he'll come and eat you. Oh, Christ. I mean, I, mean, I, I mean, I nearly fell off my chair. But know. it is, I mean, it is, so it's, it's the same again, story. it's one of the sort of fundament, fundamental ironies, you know, in the Second World War abounds with them, is that, you know, that to, to defeat to defeat the, the Nazi racist imperium, yep. you know, we hadn't, the Allied side hadn't necessarily got its house in order in the first place um, uh, on those issues. I mean, you know, it's interesting that Stephen asked about Jewish soldiers, because after when we were at Arnhem, one of the things, I mean, when we were at Arnhem, Back in September, there's so many things we didn't talk about, and, and and I came away from that experience thinking, God, we barely got started. But but lots and lots of lots and lots of Jewish soldiers in yep. in Airborne who who tended to take uh, you know take false names and conceal who they were, but but they were always they were terribly worried about getting caught because um, uh, you know they, they were German Jews principally and very yep. very very nervous of being caught and what the SS might do to them. So I mean. The, the, the race is the r- r- race is the sort of it's there as a massive factor, and then of yeah. course, and then of course in the in the Far East, you know, it, it, Indian soldiers and uh, well, yeah, but also lots of Indian soldiers captured in in North Africa, of course, yeah, right? and, and indeed in Italy, and were prisoners of um, both the both the Italians and the Germans, and they were treated really badly. And actually, it's all quite timely. It's 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 quite serendipitous because I've it, there's. There's a magazine that um, the BBC History does called World Histories, which is really good. Um, and literally, just two days ago, I was reading a piece by Daya Gupta, uh, who's an Indian academic, and she was writing about exactly this. You know, everyone sort of talks about prisoners of war and stuff, but no one kind of makes any mention of the fact that there were lots of Indians in this incredibly large, two million strong volunteer army. Um, and, and there were kind of, you know, a large number of, of Indian prisoners of war. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I've just got a quote here from, from this, this piece, and, and this is from an Indian soldier uh, writing between December 1942 and January 1943. Um, and he goes, Dear Mother, I cannot describe how atrociously we prisoners were treated by the Germans. We were given half a pint of water and one eight-ounce biscuit. This was all our daily meal. We were employed on odd jobs fatigues from early morning till it was dark. We were beaten and kicked by the Germans. We have suffered such a lot, which, if I write down, will pierce your heart. But yeah, no, I mean, they were treated accordingly. And, and, and that, again, is because of the inherent racism of the Nazi state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Right, well then, it's time for a short break. Um, when we return, we'll be talking about the senior service. Our listeners are complaining that we spent too much time on land and in the air. This pod isn't soggy enough. Well, that's a fair point, and one I relish. <laughs> Hello there, We Have Ways listeners. It's Al here. I have a small favour to ask. Now, you may have noticed on social media in recent weeks that I've been campaigning on behalf of dkms.org.uk, trying to get people to register as blood stem cell donors. I'm doing this because my nephew Finley has been diagnosed with a very rare blood cancer. He needs a blood stem cell transplant. And so do thousands of other people. Now, this is where you come in. All you have to do is go to dkms.org.uk Fill in the online form and they'll send you a swab pack. Three swabs that you rub around inside your cheek so you can send back your data that can go on their register. And then maybe one day you'll be picked as a match and give someone a second chance and maybe even save their life. Thanks very much for listening. Welcome back. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it has been suggested that we've been fixating on the poor bloody infantry and the Valiant Airborne, um, and some listeners want more seafaring chat. We're not salty enough, James, that's what it is. No, well, but fair enough. Okay. It's a fair point. It is a fair point, actually. And, and I mean, funnily enough, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot to do with the way that, you, you know, soldiers running around and hiding in fox, foxholes is kind of a bit more relatable than... Well, also, you can't, you know, you're not going to go out to the Mid-Atlantic and sit in and go, God, you know, this is where HX-77 got hammered, <laughs> are you? And so, you know, what have you got? Yeah, what, sea. Ba- yeah, Battlefield tour is exactly... <laughs> but, um... You know, so what have we got this morning? Well, we've got some more C. Um, yeah, yeah. You might not know it, but we're actually at kind of longitude X and latitude Y. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, so people want to see things, don't they? And also, yeah. there haven't been that many films there certainly hasn't been anything I suppose it's been Dust Boot recently hasn't there um, we've got Midway coming up but um, there hasn't been a huge amount on it no um, film wise or TV wise really well in which we serve yeah that's a cracker Cruel Sea one of the greatest films, snorkers. films of all time Snorkers yeah right uh, ex- bloody murderer so, that's that what, fantastic look by Jack uh, Hawkins and he just sort of goes and turns away you know the, the responsibility of command um, amazing right. stuff so, but we, so we have all acted by people who've been in the war. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, all those films of the fifties were oh, just yeah, amazing. Yeah. Right. So, Chris Harding um, got in touch on Twitter to say, and he's not the only one. How about a mention for the senior service? The pod has been great, but very army heavy. Yep. What about the Navy's annihilation of the German destroyer force at Narvik, which was a big reason why Sea Lion de- didn't happen? Hashtag We Have Ways. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if, if six to six German destroyers sent to the bottom in Narvik, yeah. absolutely annihilated. Yeah. Um, they did have some U-boats in there, but their torpedoes didn't work like they often didn't because yeah. they were a bit rubbish. Um, and, you know, Norway is always seen as a sort of terrible black mark for the Allies, particularly the British, but also the French, of course. Um, on land, unquestionably, it's, it, it's, it's a loss. Um, but at sea, it's, a, it's an undoubted triumph for the Royal Navy. And it's crazy. He never recovers, and and it never recovers. And let's not forget that 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 you know we we now know, what we now know about the Battle of Britain is that lurking in the background throughout the entire thing is the fact that the, there's a the, the Royal Navy is enormous. Yes. Um, well, and it's also bolstered by Harry Tate's Navy, which yeah. is a naval auxiliary yeah, yeah. service, yeah. which but, but, is all these fishermen, of which yeah. there are legion numbers, yeah. and all their trawlers have been given a couple of cannons on the sort of stamped onto the deck, um, and, and, and some very fine binoculars, and off they go, and they're they're kind of on anti invasion watch, and they're mine sweeping, yeah. and they're laying mines, yeah. and, and they're doing all sorts of stuff, and they're they're, you know, lots of hardy, you know, seafaring types. Um, the home fleet commanded by Admiral Forbes, he just says, this is insane. We don't need to all be in the southeast of England because there's no way we're not going to know about an invasion 24 hours beforehand. So, you know, and all our ships can get from around that. We should be protecting our convoys and being yeah. out on the West Coast and all the rest of it. Um, but they're not. And he loses that particular battle and, and they're all kept down there. And, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, people always talk about the few, you know, the fighter command being the kind of, the, you know, the last defence against the Nazi hordes and all the rest of it. They're not. They're the first line of defence. Yeah. They're not the last. They're the first. Yeah. Uh, and there is absolutely and, and it holds. Uh, yeah, uh, there is just not the remotest chance on earth of sea line ever being successful. I mean, just not a chance. Well, really, Even if I mean, the R ever been destroyed, we don't like counterfactuals on this, but um, that that one shut down. But but the thing, because because after all, what's happening in what's happening in Norway is that um, 
Is the Allied governments are going... Well, they're not Allied, really. I mean, the French and the British governments, because they're not really... Well, no, I mean, no, they're a former alliance. Yeah but, yeah, but you can't call it the Allies with a capital A, because that means you're going to win, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, they so, are. They're a former alliance, whereas Britain and America aren't. Yeah, but you know what I mean. There's still I not do. The, there's still not the they're, not really, they're not like that. They're not the allies like the Avengers. You know, it's, it's no, like okay. it's like it's like they're not all singing from the same hymn sheet. It, exactly right, and um, and they because they they've got different political requirements. They haven't figured out their common aim no. and and all that sort of stuff. So they're not they're not you know the allies. TM. They're like um, well, because everyone always sort of goes goes. You know, um, Chamberlain was forced to resign over 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 Norway, but actually it was Churchill's idea in the first place. You know. Um, well, it was Churchill's idea in September 1939 when it would have been quite a good idea. Yeah. Um, but by the time they actually agree on anything, it's April and it's a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, exactly. Um, you know, things have changed. But I think the other thing, the other thing that's worth saying about it is, is that, you know, the Battle of the Atlantic is without question the most important theatre in the entire Second World War. Mm. You know, they're, they're, it's absolutely indisputable because without the Atlantic... No, you will not None defeat Nazi Germany. None you can't do it because everything, whether it's coming from India, whether it's coming from Australia, whether yeah. it's coming from the far side of the Pacific, it's all got to get to Britain via the Atlantic. Yeah. And those sea lanes are really important. And what's really interesting about Britain is Britain realises right early on in the war that this is the case, that, that the Atlantic is the most important thing. So a huge amount of effort into its research and development of new scientific techniques and, and modern techniques for anti-U-boat um, and anti-shipping stuff that's going on, um, technology is put into the Battle of the Atlantic. So one of the key inventions is the cavity magnetron, which is what reduces the yep. size of a radar from a massive 270-foot high mast into something that you can put on a Wellington yep. or on a, frig, you know, on a on a destroyer or a corvette. Yep. Um, and the Germans never invent this, and they never know that we've got it. But it, they also have vastly increased the efficiency of, of, of Huff Duff, you know, um, high-frequency direction finding and all mm. sorts of other techniques. And I think you can argue and argue convincingly that Britain gets to a point where it's not going to lose the Battle of the Atlantic by May 1941. No, so, I, a vote, so a vote doesn't actually yeah, win yeah. the whole Battle of the Atlantic. You know, the U-boats are the, aren't defeated until May 1943, two years later. And, They're not going to lose and it. And could it be, could it be argued that the reason that um, your infantryman in a, in a foxhole has a bolt-action rifle is because the money's being spent on on those things you're talking about. The, yes. The, the brain and the effort and the, and the real cold, hard cash... Is being spent on sorting out on stuff that really matters, the really high tech thing that matters. Whereas in fact, a, a, a rifle, a, a a rifle, rifle. like a Garand, you know, a, which is much more expensive than a Lee Enfield, is just not worth spending the money on. But Lee Enfield's are really good. No, no, but but, but it's not anyway. Yeah, but the Garand, the M1 Garand, is the best rifle of the second. Well, because it's semi-automatic. Exactly, exactly. That's the that's the that's that's the point. Ding, I'm ding, 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 exactly. Ding. That's the exact point. So that's the, yeah. that's exactly the but that's the point is that the, is that the British have gone. Well, you know what. There's there's no no point upgrading that bit of kit that 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 thing's role and that thing's function we can leave them be yeah. but what we'll invent is things that is, is things that solve the problem to get those rifles that are being made in Canada yeah. to the to the UK yeah. and and so so very often this British kit discussion that people get kind of drawn into also the radios at Arnhem don't well that's because the, the radios at Arnhem aren't as important as. As a, as, a, as yeah, I think there is probably a bit of that going a, a resource, on. A resource, you know, allocation of resources. You've got to make yep. these decisions, haven't you? Because we've talked about that with uniforms before, that the Allied uniforms are all, they're all cheap and cheerful because um, if we can... They don't it, need to be expensive in flash. Exactly the point. But, but I, I think generally speaking, um, and I don't think the Allies get credit enough for this, is that their prioritisation of their assets is really good. Yeah. Of course, there are things when, retrospectively, you can say, well, they might have done it this a bit different or they might have done that. But overall, certainly when you compare to the Germans... Um, you know, their allocation of resources is pretty much spot on. They focus on what they need to focus on. Right. So, but so, but so to drag us, because we've done this again, to drag us back to the original question, how big is the, the, the Kriegsmarine in April of 1940? Oh, sorry, it's, it's languishing. And how really big is the Royal on. Navy? Oh, the, the Royal Navy is the largest navy in the world, you know, by a country mile. I mean, this is what makes the whole creation of a surface fleet, which is part of the Z plan, which is instigated in 1938. 
um, the German Zeppelin. Mm. Planet. It's, it's just such a weird, in the, nonsensical in the, in, decision. In the thirties, you have this shipbuilding ratio um, thing that's part of internet. That's like yes. a foreign policy arm wrestle and horse yes. trading that goes on. Where you know they're, we're, they're allowed. They can never have more than a third of the size of the navy. Exactly, and they never get they never get there, do they? No, not even close. No, not so, even so, close. So, so, so what they don't have is lots of shipyards making ships. What they don't have is lots of steel. What they don't have is lots of capacity for making vast, great battleships and aircraft carriers. So what do they do? They come up with the Z plan, which includes a, a naval construction project of aircraft carriers, huge battleships, and all the rest. Of it. I mean, it makes no sense. You know, the only chance they have of defeating Britain, really apart from halt orders aside that we've already talked about, is if they can win the Battle of the Atlantic. And, and what is absolutely abundantly clear in, in, is that in the OKW, the Oberkommander de Wehrmacht, which is the German general staff, there is no appreciation of this at all. Because if you read OKW War Diaries, a Kriegstag book, which has been, which is in print, you can see that all the original minutes of everything, of all the meetings and all the rest of it, and the actual war diary, it's not on that High priority list. Even Warlemont, who is kind of a part of the planning team, who, who wrote a post-war book, says in, I think, 1942, he says, you know, the Mediterranean is of equal importance with the, with the Atlantic. No, it isn't. No. Which is a whole decision about why they move U-boats out of the Atlantic into the Mediterranean. Yeah. It just isn't. It absolutely is not. And, and it is astonishing that these really quite well-educated, well-trained men don't get that. And that's because there isn't a naval tradition. Well, they, also, they're, they're continentalist also, landlords. But, but also, but if you're if you're a bloke, if you're an army, I mean, this is into service stuff too, isn't it? If you're from the army, you don't want the money being spent on the navy. You, yes, you want, but you if you are lovely, on the, if you, you are lovely the, shiny tiger, yes, with, um, but if you are in the, on the combined services German general staff, and your job is to win the war, it is your job to get a little bit no, beyond more into service. Nine, nine here, Holland. Uh, I want more tigers. I want more tigers and panthers. Yeah. Um, but even so, the only chance they've got of winning is having a vast, a pretty large, sizable U-boat fleet of at least 300 U-boats in 1939, because you have to operate on the principle of thirds. So you have a third out at sea fighting ship, sinking ships, you have a third going back and forth from the battle zone, and you have another third working up, doing maintenance, all the rest of it. Now, that's always the way it's going to be. So if you've got a fleet of 300 U-boats, you're only going to have 100 in the Atlantic at any one time. What is amazing about 1940, when they do actually sink quite a lot, because a lot of the convoys aren't escorted because they're all oh, on anti Invasion watch yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is, is that there's never more than 14 U boats in operation at one time in the entire Atlantic. And by January 1941, when things are getting quite critical because the Luftwaffe has just lost the Battle of Britain and it's all going pear shaped, um, they only have six. And that is just not going to win you the war. Uh, and by May, of course, you've got the Bismarck has been sunk, one of two great battleships, yeah. um, along with the Tirpitz. Um, so that's out. Um, you've got um, three of your greatest aces, dead or prisoner, Kretschmer, Shepka and, and Preen. They've, yeah. um, Shepka and, and, and Preen are dead. Kretschmer's been captured. Um, you've lost the Enigma Naval codes. Yeah. Um, you're not going to win from there. And, and at the same time, the Canadians are really starting to grow their own navy. They, they've gone from nothing to, to this in a very short yeah. period of time. Um, the, the, the gap, the air gap in the mid-Atlantic is getting less and less with every passing month. British allied technology is getting better and the U-boats are not getting better. They're, they're the same old submersibles. They're not even proper submarines. And German industry is having to churn out panzers and yep. panzers like mad because of the Russian front and, and churn out... Absolutely. Fight, and the, and the problem like is, is that the U-boat force in 1939 is only 3,000 strong. So your base is not very big when you want to do sudden enlargement. Yeah. If you've only got 3,000 men, that doesn't go very far when you want to suddenly when expand you, it to uh, kind of 300. Uh, yeah, yeah, spread the anti. skills and all yeah. that. Yeah. So the annihilation of the German destroyer force at Narvik is, the, is, the, is, is, a big, is a big reason why Sea Line didn't happen. I mean, it really is. Although even if, even if those... Both those ships hadn't been at the bottom of the sea in Norway. Even then, the Kriegsmarine wouldn't have... Sea Lion... I mean, Sea Lion's a no-go anyway. I mean, Well, I, I would change that. I would say um, Narvik is a very important reason why they don't win... They don't even come close to winning the Battle of the Atlantic. Yeah. There we go. And that, that is the most important theatre. Does that answer your question, Chris Harding? I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> is that enough Navy for you? God, dear. I mean, you know, I'm... 
It's all no, car- I mean, it's nothing can do more, Navy. It's all khaki to me, James. I'm, I'm, I'm khaki through and through. Um, right, well, time to bid you all farewell. Just a reminder, we're currently operating on a twice-weekly schedule. Um, rather like the village my parents live in, in rural Buckinghamshire, where the bus to the nearby town comes on a Tuesday <laughs> and goes home on a Thursday. <laughs> you can't get to the supermarket from where they live, <laughs> unless you're prepared to stay the night in lane and bus it. <laughs> anyway, just a reminder, we're currently operating on a twice-weekly schedule with a regular Tuesday pod and then bonus episode on a Thursday. Some of the interviews James has carried out for us on the bonus pods have been enthralling and if you haven't been listening I'd thoroughly recommend you catch up and comb through. A friend of mine, a very very good friend of mine, I lent him um, Zeno's The Cauldron because he's, ah. he's a big he's, he's a fiction man and he really likes hard boiled sort of thriller fiction. Yeah. He said well read this and I, he, he wrote back to me I'm like oh, dear god you know it's, whoa, that's stern meat and then wrote going which one's the Arnhem podcast i said well there's nine so we've got him we've got him and he's like he's like he's like a fly trapped in in amber you know <laughs> we've got him <laughs> so Good catch work. up if you can um yeah and we're also gonna um we're, we're planning a major campaign around the battle of the bars a bit like the one we did for arnhem we did yeah. nine days of that yeah are we, are we doing two weeks worth of maybe three, not three, but anyway, a month, we're, we're, a, month <laughs> of, a month of battle of <laughs> anyway we're gonna go out to the battle of bars in, in december in. we're gonna be we're gonna be kind of rubbing our hands together in the snow mm. um, um, and, um, and shouting nuts at passers by. Nuts! Nuts! I never really understood that one, but... What does this mean? What is, <laughs> what is nuts? Nuts! Is this positive? Is it, is it negative? Is it positive? It's anyway. Ne- it's negative, buddy. <laughs> That's the conversation. Yeah, but, but we're going to go, out, we're gonna go to dropping, It's brilliant when they're dropping them back. The guys have come under the white flag. He's dropping them back. He goes, what is this nuts? What does it mean? Is it positive? Is it negative? He says, it's, it's negative, pal. And then, he, and then he wished them luck and regrets ever wishing them luck. Yeah. The story on the collar for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, you can't really say Bastogne unless you say an American accent. Bastogne. Bastogne. Yeah. Anyway, Anyways, so we're going to go to Bastogne. Very excited. We're, we're, we're going to go to some Vit, and we're going to we're yeah. going to go to Malmody yeah. and follow that legend that is Joachim Piper. And thermals. And actually, I've got a Bring guy who's been in touch with me, a chap called Neil Thompson, who is clearly an expert on Joachim Piper. So he's going to give me the gen on Joachim Piper, which they're is good. good. Yeah, they're good. Looking uh, forward anyway, to that. anyway, we're going to keep you up to speed with our plans, um, but I can tell you they include the prospect of Al Murray and I being trapped in winter around Bastogne Forest. Yeah, lovely. Superb. Looking forward to that. Bye for now. Cheerio. Cheerio.